Okay, well, well, thank you, and thanks, thanks for the invitation, and it's, it's good to be here. Um, as, you, as you've heard, I've, I've been here for the last uh, two years, um, much enjoyed the session, and, and I think it's a fabulous program. So, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a career academic. Um, not all vice chancellors uh, are career academics, but the majority are, and I'm, I'm one of them. Um, my own academic background is as a historian. Um, I was a historian of modern Britain, um, and I was particularly interested in what historians call the process of state formation, the way in which states develop, um, uh, and the way in which the structures of power uh, are articulated. And you might actually think that's not a bad training for a vice chancellor. Um, I was uh, educated at the University of Oxford, um, and I taught at Oxford. Um, so the majority of my uh, teaching career was at uh, the University of Oxford, uh, which I left in, in 1995. Um, uh, I went from Oxford to the University of Swansea, uh, where I was for five years. Um, and then, as I'll say in a minute, um, I lost control of my career. Um, from very early on, and I think this is partly my Oxford formation, um, I came to the view that academic institutions are best led and run by academics. Um, but they have to be good at it. Um, so I, I suppose I had a vision at that stage that a subset of, of academics needed over time, as well as developing their academic career, to develop other kinds of leadership skills and, and skills in, in, in management. And I was, I was fortunate at, at, at Oxford in that people gave me the opportunity, in a sense, to learn on the job. Um, so the first very big job um, I, I did was I was senior tutor in my college um, between 1992 and 1995. And effectively that meant I was day-to-day -to -day running the college. And I was, I was, quite, I was quite young uh, at the time. So I was, I was 33 when I was appointed senior tutor. Um, until 2000, I did those sorts of leadership roles uh, alongside um, a heavy teaching load, um, a lot of graduate supervision, um, and I published a lot. Uh, I certainly published a lot for a historian. Um, uh, so, I mean, I demonstrated to myself that it was possible uh, simultaneously to take your teaching seriously, to be a highly productive researcher, and to take leadership positions. Um, at Swansea, um, I was simultaneously um, head of two departments and a dean of a faculty. Uh, so I was head of history, I was head of philosophy, because they couldn't find somebody to lead philosophy. Um, and I was also dean of the faculty. Um, and then I became a pro-vice chancellor at Swansea. I said a moment ago, um, in 2000, I lost control of my career, um, which is broadly true, um, uh, because, as, as you may know, um, the way in which quite a lot of senior positions in higher education now filled um, is through institutions hiring what are known colloquially as headhunters, um, that they don't like to be described as headhunters, they like to be described as executive search. It sounds more respectable than headhunting. Um, and in 2000, um, I was headhunted to go and run the then embryonic Arts and Humanities Research Board, what is now the AHRC, Arts and Humanities Research Council, and maybe people in this room who are funded by them. Um, and that was, that was fascinating because that was, in effect, running a startup. So it was a business, it was a business startup. Um, there hadn't been a research council for uh, the humanities. Um, and uh, I inherited it when effectively it was nine months old and most of its structures weren't in place. So as well as bringing leadership, academic leadership, to, to the humanities, I, I was also setting up an organisation. And that complemented really my, some of my Oxford experience at having big jobs at smaller scale. And um, when, if you ask me why, why I'm qualified to do what I'm doing, um, well, I have no formal qualifications to do what I'm doing at all, actually. Um, but in, in terms of the way in which I've, I've learned and developed, it has been through those kinds of opportunities, as I say, learning on the job. Then in 2002, the headhunters came again, um, and I became a vice-chancellor for the first time. And I was vice-chancellor of the University of East Anglia in Norwich. Um, fine university, smaller university than our uh, university. Um, 
and, and I was at, at, at UEA for four years. I carried on doing some quite big national roles while I was Vice Chancellor of, of East Anglia, so I was still noticed. Um, and then in 2006, I was headhunted to run the Higher Education Funding Council. Uh, it's changed a bit since, but when I was there, it was the major funder uh, of uh, undergraduate education, and it was a very large funder of research. So I was, I was there for three years, effectively, uh, uh, running the funding and providing leadership across the whole of the higher education sector. And then in 2009, the headhunters came again, um, and the University of Birmingham was looking for uh, a new vice chancellor. Um, and I came to, to Birmingham in, in 2009. So I'm, I'm here, I'm in my, going into my fifth year now as, as vice chancellor. Um, <clears throat> to nobody describes me as the new vice chancellor anymore. Um, they haven't yet, at least my face, described me as the, the vice chancellor who's outstayed his welcome. Um, but uh, I've, I've been here uh, now, as I say, just over four years, uh, very happily. Um, I said at the outset, by academic background, uh, I'm a historian. Um, I effectively stopped being a practicing historian back in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the differences between those of us who come from humanities backgrounds and those who come from science backgrounds is that in the main, it's, it's changed a bit now, th thanks to the AHRC, but in my day, um, subjects like history were very much um, individual researcher disciplines. Mm -hmm. So once you, once you took on a major leadership role, you didn't have a research group uh, that you could continue to, to, to work with and to interact with. Um, so I, I, haven't, I haven't written any, any serious history uh, since uh, 2000. I did a little bit of teaching uh, of history when I was at East Anglia, but in the end I decided I wasn't sufficiently up to date anymore and also I just couldn't find the regular time commitment to do it. So. Um, uh, I, I, I don't supervise, I don't teach, and I don't write anymore. Um, I have, however, set up a, a seminar, a uh, Vice Chancellor's Seminar, which I've run now for two years here, where I, I work with 15 of the brightest undergraduates in, in a seminar that I run uh, over the year. So I, I, I'm, I miss that part of teaching, and it's just a way of, as it were, sort of keeping my hand in. And do you miss being an active researcher? Do you miss that aspect? Uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's a good question, um, and in some ways it's the right question to ask. Um, I think, but nobody should say yes to that, uh, to that question, because you, know, you have a choice. You know, I, I, I could have remained uh, as a researcher and a teacher. Um, I could have become a research professor if I'd so wished. So I made, I made an active choice, given that I had choices to make, to say, yes, I would go into... Um, uh, institutional and national leadership roles. Um, so, um, in one sense, yes, of course, I, I miss it. I mean, th th those who teach um, and teach well derive enormous satisfaction from it. Um, and it might be the buzz you get from you know, del delivering a lecture to 500. Um, it might be the real intellectual challenge you get from a, a supervision of, of a brilliant um, DPhil PhD uh, student. Um, uh, you know, researching and writing is, you know, is hugely challenging and hugely exciting, um, you know, especially for people who come out of my kinds of disciplines. You know, the writing of your subject, in my case, writing books, writing articles, is a hugely creative uh, process. So yes, all of that is, is, is incredibly satisfying. Um, uh, and in 2000, um, I was headhunted to go and run the then embryonic Arts and Humanities Research Board, what is now the AHRC, Arts and Humanities Research Council, and maybe people in this room who are funded by them. Um, and that was, that was fascinating because that was, in effect, running a startup. So it was a business, it was a business startup. Um, there hadn't been a research council for uh, the humanities. Um, and uh, I inherited it when effectively it was nine months old and most of its structures weren't in place. So as well as bringing leadership, academic leadership, to, to the humanities, I, I was also setting up an organisation. And that complemented really my, some of my Oxford experience at having big jobs at smaller scale. And um, when, if you ask me why, why I'm qualified to do what I'm doing, um, 
well, I have no formal qualifications to do what I'm doing at all, actually. Um, but in, in terms of the way in which I've, I've learned and developed, it has been through those kinds of opportunities, as I say, learning on the job. Then in 2002, the headhunters came again, um, and I became a vice-chancellor for the first time. And I was vice-chancellor of the University of East Anglia in Norwich. Um, fine university, smaller university than our uh, university. Um, and, and I was at, at, at UEA for four years. I carried on doing some quite big national roles while I was vice-chancellor of, of East Anglia, so I was still noticed. Um, and then in 2006, I was headhunted to run the Higher Education Funding Council. Uh, it's changed a bit since, but when I was there, it was the major funder uh, of uh, undergraduate education, and it was a very large funder of research. So I was, I was there for three years, effectively, uh, uh, running the funding and providing leadership across the whole of the higher education sector. And then in 2009, the headhunters came again, um, and the University of Birmingham was looking for uh, a new vice-chancellor. Um, and I came to, to Birmingham in, in 2009. So I'm, I'm here, I'm in my, going into my fifth year now as, as vice-chancellor. Um, <clears throat> to nobody describes me as the new vice-chancellor anymore. Um, they haven't yet, at least my face, described me as the, the vice-chancellor whose outstate is welcome. Um, but uh, I've, I've been here uh, now, as I say, just over four years, uh, very happily. Um, I said at the outset, by academic background, uh, I'm a historian. Um, I effectively stopped being a practicing historian back in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the differences between those of us who come from humanities backgrounds and those who come from science backgrounds is that in the main, it's, it's changed a bit now, th thanks to the AHRC, but in my day, um, subjects like history were very much um, individual researcher disciplines. Mm -hmm. So once you, once you took on a major leadership role, you didn't have a research group uh, that you could continue to, to, to work with and to interact with. Um, so I, I, haven't, I haven't written any, any serious history uh, since uh, 2000. I did a little bit of teaching uh, of history when I was at East Anglia, but in the end I decided I wasn't sufficiently up to date anymore and also I just couldn't find the regular time commitment to do it. So. Um, uh, I, I, I don't supervise, I don't teach, and I don't write anymore. Um, I have, however, set up a, a seminar, a uh, vice chancellor's seminar, which I've run now for two years here, where I, I work with 15 of the brightest undergraduates in, in a seminar that I run uh, over the year. So I, I, I'm, I miss that part of teaching, and it's just a way of, as it were, sort of keeping my hand in. And do you miss being an active researcher? Do you miss that aspect? Uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's a good question, um, and in some ways it's the right question to ask. Um, I think, but nobody should say yes to that, uh, to that question, because you, know, you have a choice. You know, I, I, I could have remained uh, as a researcher and a teacher. Um, I could have become a research professor if I'd so wished. So I made, I made an active choice, given that I had choices to make, to say, yes, I would go into... Um, uh, institutional and national leadership roles. Um, so, um, in one sense, yes, of course, I, I miss it. I mean, th th those who teach um, and teach well derive enormous satisfaction from it. Um, and it might be the buzz you get from you know, del delivering a lecture to 500. Um, it might be the real intellectual challenge you get from a, a supervision of, of a brilliant um, DPhil PhD uh, student. Um, uh, you know, researching and writing is you know, it's hugely challenging and hugely exciting, um, you know, especially for people who come out of my kinds of disciplines. You know, the writing of your subject, in my case, writing books, writing articles, is a hugely creative uh, process. So yes, all of that is, is, is incredibly satisfying. Um, uh, and, uh, and did I enjoy doing it? Yes, hugely. Um, do I still think I could do it? Well, you need to sort of retrain me, but I probably could go back to doing it. But I derive um, great satisfaction from what I'm doing now. And also, um, I don't think I've ceased to think intellectually. Um, and I don't think, as it were, intellectually what I do now is less challenging than what I do. It's, it's challenging in different ways, but I don't think it's less challenging. So I don't, I don't feel my mind's atrophied in the process. Um, 
Uh, but I mean, the, the real answer to your perfectly reasonable question is I made a choice. If you're fortunate enough to be able to make choices, mm -hmm. um, unless you make a bad choice, you shouldn't regret the choices you make. How would you say, um, may I ask, that you transfer your research skills to help you lead at an institutional level? Yeah. Is there a transfer in that? I think, I, I think there is, um, and I think that's probably general and particular. Mm -hmm. So, in general, um, uh, I, I think one of the things, well, well, one of the things I would say about leadership in, in serious universities is it has to be authentic. Um, and authenticity means, um, when, when I'm talking about the importance of education, then I might not be teaching anymore, but people know I've done it. Um, and, and you're able to understand the issues even when the issues move on. Mm -hmm. So when we're debating sort of MOOCs and virtual learning and MOOCs weren't around you know, in, my, in my day as a teacher, yeah. it, I, I, I know what the craft is, I, I know how you teach, I know mm -hmm. what it would mean as, as, a, as a university teacher to think about mm -hmm. um, you know, the making of a MOOC. Um, so those things transfer. Um, when I'm talking about you know, needing to raise the university's grant capture. You know, you know I've, I've done it on both sides. I, I've won grants, I've distributed grants uh, as a research funder. Um, so again, th there's, this isn't a sort of desiccated, you know, I got it from a management manual. This is you know, something I've done and I've been a part of, of university communities. Um, uh, the, uh, in terms of the particular, you know, what does... I think, yeah, we, we, do, we are all formed in particular ways. I mean, we, we have our own undergraduate disciplines. Our research uh, might flow directly from them or might build on them. But there is, a, there is that process of intellectual formation, um, which does stay with us. So um, in, in a number of ways, yes, I still think and operate as a historian. Um, one of the things... Um, uh, a lot of historians are really good at is reading things very quickly. You can do that. Um, one of the things historians are very good at is assimilating um, an understanding of, of, of fields and areas that they're unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great advantage. You know, in my case, um, my writing was, well, quite a lot of my writing, as I say, was about states, structures of power, the way in which policy is, is made. Um, and of course that has a read across as well. So I think different vice chancellors would give you different answers to the way in which their disciplinary background shapes the kind of leader they become. But I think, there, yes, I think there is a, an important read across. Thank you. You mentioned the word authenticity. Mm. Are there any other words that you could share with us that describe your approach to leadership? Um, well, I mean, of course, authenticity is, is as it were, in the, behind, in the eye of the beholder. So it may, it may be that others don't think that it's, it's particularly authentic. Um, I mean, I mean we, might, we might get on to this. I mean, I think that you know, one of the things you've got to be as a, as, as a vice chancellor is, is have a, a repertoire of resources that you can draw on. So the challenge at any given moment might be different from the challenge of two or three years ago. And so you can't constantly just rely on, on one style, one trope. You've got, to, you, you've got to have a sort of repertoire that you, you, you can call on. Um, but as I said right at the outset, I do think authenticity is important because I do think academic institutions should be led by, by academics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think... Um, it's important if you go into leadership roles that you derive real satisfaction from other people's success. So if you're, if you're, if you're leading the university, um, insofar as you succeed as a vice chancellor, you succeed because you're, the university succeeds. And the university succeeds because the people in it succeed. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of what you're doing is creating the space, creating the conditions for other people to thrive. Um, and, and, and you, you've, got, you've, got, you've got to relish that. Um, and, and also, uh, you've got to... Ha leadership requires confidence. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're not confident uh, as, as a leader, um, then two things flow from that. One is your lack of certainty ripples across the institution. And, and two, if you're not confident, you are always luck looking for those kinds of, of affirmations for people to tell you you're doing a good job. Believe me, if you're vice chancellor, people rarely tell you 
you're doing a good job. And it might conceivably be that you're not doing a bad job. Um, so, so I think com- confidence does matter. Um, Decision making is, is really important. You, you, you've got to, I mean, if you're in a leader, you've got to be a good decision maker. You know, the worst thing you can do um, is, is not make a decision, is be indecisive. Um, and I can tell you some stories about some vice chancellors who have run their institutions pretty close to running them into the ground because they're not capable of making decisions. Um, uh, and, and I think you've got to enjoy working with people. This is, you know, you know this is not a this is not a solo performance. Um, in, you know, in some ways you're you're orchestrating. In some ways you're sort of conducting the orchestra. Um, so you've got to be good at working with people. You've got to be good at identifying talent. You've got to be good at developing uh, people. Um, but I'll tell, I'll tell you a story about why I think confidence matters. When I was appointed as chief executive of AHRB, um, I was forty one. I was the youngest chief exec of any major organisation in higher education. Um, I'm more than a decade younger than the chief execs of the other research councils. Um, so I thought I had to prove myself. Really important that I, you know, I, I, I reassured AHRB, I reassured the sector, here they were, they'd hired this guy and he was really good. Um, and I'd been doing the job for about two months, and one of my colleagues in the middle of the organisation said, I've got this really difficult problem, can I come and see you? So I said, yeah, of course, yeah, come and see me, we'll talk about it. So he came in and he presented the problem, and I said, oh, that's very straightforward, what you need to do is you need to do this, do that, um, talk to X, and then Y will happen. Great, you know, really good hire, I'm a good guy, I know how to do it. Um, and there was something about the way he walked out of the room that made me think, I've got that wrong. Um, and then that evening, it dawned on me what I'd got wrong. You know, here was somebody who'd gone to the chief executive and said he'd got a really difficult problem and he needed to talk to the chief executive. And what I had said is it's not a problem at all. It's very straightforward. You do this, you do that, you do the other. So suddenly... Um, well, what I should have been doing was developing his confidence. Uh, I'd actually undermined his confidence um, in order to try and prove myself. And you know, it's, uh, it, it's a little vignette, but it, it does tell you that if you are in a leadership position, um, of course there are moments where you should be brutal, of course there are moments where you have to deliver tough messages, and of course there are moments where you can't spend a lot of time. You know, you senior people, you've just got to do things quickly. Mm-hmm. But when you're trying to develop people, build people up, um, when people, in a sense, have screwed up their courage and say, I need to talk to the boss, it's really important that you don't undermine them. And that's actually, for me, that's an example of why confidence is important. I didn't have an open-ended position, you know, a confer- what, you know, what you would have called tenure, until I was 30, right? So people sort of look at people like me and say, oh, well, you know, there he was, you know, got a scholarship to Oxford, got a first, um, you know, vice-chancellor of Birmingham, you know, leading figure in higher education, silver spoon, everything was straightforward, must have succeeded in everything he went for. It's not true. Um, so it, it, it's important, and, and, and I, I was making my career in the 80s, which is actually not dissimilar to some of the challenges that we now face. The 80s were a, a you know, difficult era. They were an era of, you know, of funding challenges and so forth. Um, so you know, we, we, we live in and we, we want to succeed in a world which is competitive, Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and actually we live or die by processes in one way or another of selection and peer review um, so we can't afford to be fragile we can't afford to be easily knocked back we can't afford to be discouraged when somebody you know, uh, rejects an article or sends it back with a sort of revise and resubmit and you're really irritated um, and you can't assume that you're going for a job and you're going to get it however good you are so, you know, I think, I think realism is, 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 is really important. In my experience, many of, most of, not all of, um, 
but most of the people who are really good, who want academic careers, succeed. It would be, it would be wrong to say all, but, but, but the majority do. Um, so, so persistence matters. Um, uh, I think, and, and, and I think this comes back to, to programs like this and other programs, um, being able to present yourself well, um, uh, being able not just to interview well, but to interact well, because now you know, most, most academic appointments are not, oh, answer it, fill in an ad, uh, see an advert, fill in an application form, turn up for an interview if you're, uh, if you're shortlisted. Um, most academic appointments involve an, an, an element of, of, of what I call courtship, but you know, you'll, you'll often be invited I mean, uh, to perhaps to go and give us do a seminar, um, invited to meet people uh, in the school and in, in, in the department. There will be, you know, a, quite a, 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 an elaborate process around appointments, um, and, and universities are taking appointments ever more seriously. They're major investments in people, um, and you know, they're the key assets of the university. So, understanding the way the process works, understanding how to to present yourself and to operate in that process uh, is important. Quality matters. Um, so you know, nobody's going to get a, a job in the current environment because they've published a lot of third-rate stuff. Um, so when supervisors uh, insist on the importance of quality, quality in publication, yes, that really does matter. Um, you know, you're, 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 your, your, your publications are, you know, the currency you're, you're trading in. Um, but by the same token, um, and this is particularly a problem in the humanities and the social sciences, less so a problem in the sciences because you're part of groups that drive you. Um, you, you get this kind of, oh, I'm a perfectionist. If you've ever said that, never say it again. Because I am a perfectionist is, is shorthand for... I can do something absolutely brilliant, but I'll never quite get round to doing it. Um, uh, and, and, and I've seen an, a number of careers stumble, um, and, uh, and, and, and some careers simply stop, because people get themselves into this, I'm a perfectionist. Um, not least because, as academics, we have a duty to communicate, which means we have a duty to publish, we have a duty to com communicate in other ways, in, in terms of the, the more popular communication of our research and disciplines. But we do have a duty to communicate. And people who are, who are not publishing with the rhythm that is appropriate to their subject, their research, and their discipline are falling down on what I regard as a core responsibility of those of us who work uh, in universities as well as not building their own career. So actually doing the right thing and doing the thing which is right for you come together quite nicely. The, the Vice-Chancellor is um, the, the in, in the jargon, the Vice-Chancellor is the Principal Officer of the University. Um, so, if you thought about the university in a different way, you know, this, is, this is a 500 million pound business. A business that employs uh, 6,142 people. You know, a business of 28,000 students. If this was a business, I would be the chief executive. And I do do uh, the things that chief executives of businesses do. Um, so I'm responsible uh, ultimately, for the strategy of the university, I'm responsible uh, ultimately uh, for the way in which we align our financial resources to the strategy. Um, uh, I'm responsible for policy. Um, ultimately, I'm responsible for what goes wrong. I may occasionally get some credit for what goes right. Um, but when we're not a business, or we are much more than a business, so the other part of, of, of my role is, is academic leadership. Um, but it's academic leadership that has to be shared and has to be very broadly shared. So in order to make that work, I've got to develop uh, support, work with a very broad team. 
Um, so there's, the, there's, there's my immediate team. Here is the university executive board. Uh, me plus, plus 12 others that meet every week. And we are you know, the senior leadership team of the university. But I spend quite a lot of my time working with um, other leaders, uh, heads, of, heads of school, heads of uh, department, directors, um, and the people who lead professional services in the university. Because a complicated organisation like this requires um, that kind of distributed uh, leadership. Um, I also, a university like Birmingham needs to have what would be regarded outside as quote unquote a leading vice chancellor. Um, and that means um, a vice chancellor who has a profile outside the university. Um, so I do a number of things in higher education um, outside the university. So I currently, for example, uh, chair the Russell Group, the group of the 24 leading universities uh, in the country. Um, um, I have a series of roles. So yesterday um, uh, I was in Liverpool because um, I'm a director of the university superannuation scheme, the pension scheme for the sector, which is a £39 billion scheme. So, so I do those other kinds of things uh, which complement what I do. They raise the profile of Birmingham, um, but I'm also contributing more broadly uh, to um, uh, the, the life of the universities. And then, you know, I am the principal public face of the university. Um, so, um, uh, and that might be true in the city, it might be true nationally, and it's true internationally as well. So, um, what does that mean? Um, it means um, that uh, my diary takes me from one thing to another to another. Um, the diary is very full. Somebody kindly said, could I come along to something on Tuesday? Um, usually, the diary is full for about six months. Um, and um, it also means that, um, as the football managers would say, I put in a shift. Um, so um, I, work, um, I work in the day and in the evening, and usually in the evening I'm doing things which are that sort of public-facing thing, so I might be hosting things or I might be uh, at things. Um, and just occasionally I see my wife. <laughs>
I probably don't leave enough time for, for reflection, as you describe it. Um, though my colleagues actually don't like it when I have a lot of time on my hands, because I usually come up with a whole series of new ideas, which I then say, why don't we do this, 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 and this, and then everybody's running around trying to deal with the Vice Chancellor's <laughs> new ideas. So my PA is often told by my colleagues, keep him busy, otherwise he's going to have more ideas. Um, I, I'm, I, I mean, I've been doing these kinds of things for a long time. So you know, I've been in you know, senior positions as, as vice chancellor in a national organisation for 13 years now. Um, so I have quite a, you know, what I would describe as a quite a, a, a deep hinterland of experience and understanding. Which means I can I can respond more quickly than people who were just as it were coming into to these kinds of roles, and also going back to the question about well how how do you work and how do you work as a as an academic? I mean I um, I can assimilate information quickly, I can respond quickly, I can order things uh, quickly in my mind. So I probably need less time than some others to do that kind of reflection. Um, I often find uh, the moments where you are most creative is, is where you're away. So if, if I'm away internationally um, and I'm, I'm doing a visit, I might be visiting another institution, I might be at an you know, international meeting of university presidents, some of which are very boring. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's partly because you're away, you, you distance from the institution, it's partly because you're doing some other things. And actually, so your mind starts working differently. And and new ideas formulate, or you, you bump into somebody who's doing something, and very often you don't say, oh, I think we should do that at Birmingham, but it sparks a train of thought which leads you to say, we should be doing that. And the other thing I think you've got to do as a vice chancellor is you've got to be able to move and move on quite quickly. Um, so some people would say of their vice chancellors, what they're really interested in is this and this and this. I think if you ask my colleagues, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't say that because it's, it's the things I think matter most at the moment um, that I'm focused on. Um, and some stuff just happens. You know, something I can't talk about uh, that just happened last week, which was a major issue uh, for the university. Um, you know, and, it, and it hit my iPad at 20 to 12 at night. Um, and I needed, you know, it needed thought from me. It needed me to make time to meet the people who are going to deal with this particular problem. Um, and they needed to have my support and my perspective. So you've got to be very good in, in this kind of role at saying, OK, I wasn't expecting to have to think about that or deal with that. It's just happened. But he, here I am. I'm, I'm dealing with it. I'm engaging with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll, um, I'll be cutting the lawn, providing it doesn't rain, um, sometime this weekend. And when I'm cutting the lawn, I'm usually thinking about you know, things at the university. So it's quite often in, in those sorts of moments that some of your more interesting thoughts occur. I mean, people like me are often asked to do, to do other things. You know, I'm constantly being approached, will I go and you know, be president of this university or that university? Um, and I say no, just in case anybody wants to go away and spread a rumour. Um, uh, but there are times where you think you've contributed what you can in a particular role, and then you're ready to move on. Um, and so when, I, when I've changed my role, um, it's been two things. One, I've thought I've made a significant contribution, and you know, there is a sort of natural point. And somebody's come along and said, you know, would you be interested in this? And it was, and it was very exciting. So when the, University, when the University of Birmingham came, I, had, I wasn't intending at that point to leave the funding council. I'd just got the best financial settlement that higher education ever got out of government. And so I was feeling pretty good about that. Um, and then I would be going into a, a, a new cycle. I knew there'd be a general election. Um, I thought I knew what happened in the general election. I wasn't quite right about that. Um, uh, and so you know, I'd, I'd done something quite big at the funding council. Birmingham came along, um, and as I said at the time I was appointed, you know, when, when they asked me what was I interested in, would I come, I said it was irresistible, and it was. Um, so, you know, I think that sort of timing is, is something that very often you can't predict. Um, uh, but it, it, in the end, it, I mean, intellectually it feels right, but, you know, 
somewhere in here it also feels right. I mean, for people like me, um, in, you know, fighting the battle to maximise the funding that goes into higher education in general and maximising the funding that flows to our university, I mean, that, that's always a, you know, a big part of what you do. It goes back to being a chief executive. Um, and because I'm a, you know, a major figure in the sector, I used to run the funding council, I chair the Russell Group, um, I, I was on the Brown Review, um, people expect me to be a, a major player in, in the funding battles. So yes, it is. I think the, but the, but then another part of the role um, is is not to is not just to speak money to the university. Um, you know, the university having money is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Higher education having money is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. So the really important thing in my role is to balance the academic strategy, or if you like, the academic ambition of the university with the resource that we have available. And there's always really tough choices there. I mean, that's the, that's the difficult space. Um, but you know, as a university, the, the, the more carefully formed, the more ambitious, the more enterprising our academic strategy, the more, the, the less we will have problems in, in resourcing it, paradoxically. Um, anybody who knows the answer to what's going to happen to MOOCs um, can probably have a, a very big reputation ahead of them, because none of us really know is, is, is the answer. Um, and, um, you know, ever since um, the beginnings of the internet, you know, we've always been told, you know, the future is, is, is going to be digital, the future is going to be virtual, you know, you know the university is dead, you know, face-to-face -face teaching will be a thing of the past. Um, and you know, people who've argued that have always been proved wrong. Uh, and I think anybody who says... Um, you know, this is the end of, of the university as a place where people come together, where you know, those who research and those who learn come together. Anybody who thinks that's over, I think has just got it spectacularly wrong. You know, did it in classical Athens, we're doing it now, and we'll still be doing it in, in, you know, in the middle of the next millennium. Um, and there are good reasons for that, and if we had a lot of time, we could have a very interesting discussion about why it will always be important um, that people who are interested in... Um, the creation of understanding, the creation of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge and the absorption of knowledge will always want to come together. You know, but the world is changing, of course it is. Um, and, you know, and, and, the, and, and, and the MOOC is quite an, you know, it's probably quite an interesting staging point in that. So we've, we've had a, quite a, a deep reflection on what we, should, what we at Birmingham should do with MOOCs. Um, and we're going to launch two in the autumn, uh, and then three more thereafter. Uh, and we will see what happens. It's partly um, because in this new virtual world, you've got to find ways of getting your brand and reputation out there. Um, uh, it's partly that we do actually have, a, as I was saying earlier, a responsibility to communicate in a whole range of ways um, the, the, the knowledge and understanding which resides in, in a university. Um, and, you know, and it's partly because some people want to learn in different and novel ways. Um, the current data are that 7% of those who begin auditing MOOCs finish them. They're not examined, they're not credentialed, but they finish them, they get to the end, you know, they watch the last episode. Um, so that's a pretty big fallout. Um, and nobody knows how, you can't make any money out of that. Um, you can make money out of assessment, um, uh, out of, so as Americans would say, credentialing. Um, and you know, Edinburgh is just beginning to dip its toe into that water. Um, and there will be some market for that. Um, but the most likely market, if you, if you take a MOOC from the University of Birmingham, you like the MOOC, um, you're more likely to sign up on a more orthodox 
academic programme, i.e. to come to, to Birmingham, you know, or to do uh, a distance learning PhD uh, that we now do, um, or to do some kind of blended learning or some kind of 2 plus 2 sort of provision. So I think what, uh, quite a lot of what the MOOCs will do for the leading universities is, is feed people into something that looks more traditional. Um, uh, they will be expensive to put on. You know, this isn't just um, you know, taking a camera into a lecture, you know, filming the lecture and putting it up online. They've got to be thought through. They've got to be thought through in, in curriculum terms and in terms of course design. Um, so there is a cost. The cost is not easily recovered. So I don't think we're going to see you know, universities like ours with hundreds of MOOCs. Um, in, in, in the foreseeable future, it will be a part of, 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 what, we, of, of what we do. Um, and the other thing that will happen, and some people were talking to me earlier about the new virtual learning environment, some of what we will be doing through the new VLE and some of what we will do, be doing in, with MOOCs will, will come together. And so some of the kinds of, of provision that will characterise MOOCs will also characterise the way in which we deliver a part of our programmes to people who are already a, a, here at Birmingham. I mean, in headline, in terms, um, the university succeeding. And that's, you know, that's, what, that's why I'm here. That's why I came to Birmingham. I thought when I came to Birmingham, I was coming to a, you know, a fine university that could be even better. And that was, you know, that's the journey that we're on. Um, so, you know, it, it's seeing the university succeed. Um, and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a vice chancellor, it, it, it's a hugely privileged role. I just get to do all sorts of really interesting things. Um, and, um, you know, I have, there, there are vice chancellors who sort of complain, they complain about how hard they work. Um, and usually when they're complaining to me, I think, well, I work much harder than that. Um, they complain about what they have to do. They complain about the difficulty of what they have to do. Um, and, and, you know, my answer is, if you really don't like it, you don't have to do it. Um, and, and actually, you know, I was just thinking about it in the wrong way. I mean, this is, you know, it's a great privilege to be able to, to do these sorts of things. You, you do, I have to say, if, you, if you're a vice chancellor, you do the job properly. You don't really do anything else. So you don't, you don't have another life. Um, you know, you see your wife, and you know, when they're at home, I used to see my kids. But, um, but you know, mo you, know you, you don't, you know, you can't you know, play golf, or in my case, you know, um, can't play in an orchestra or anything like that. You just don't have that kind of free time. But the, com you know, the compensations are just enormous, and that's what you, that's what you derive your, your satisfaction uh, from. It's important to create an understanding across the institution that we succeed together. Um, uh, so for the university to succeed, we need an incredibly successful research base. Uh, we, need, we need successful individual researchers. We need successful groups. Um, then I think we, it's, it's important that they understand, I mean, not just from me, but from the way you know, the university works, that if you're, if you're an outstanding you know, group, let's, let's, let's stay with research groups now, if you're an outstanding group here, you know, the university will support you, it will invest in you, it doesn't want to lose you, it wants to keep you, it wants you to, to succeed. Um, uh, and then the third thing I'd say is you've got to be able to have the right kind of com conversations. Um, and interestingly, however good people are, um, they, they, they appreciate recognition. Um, so, um, you know, a part of what I do is, is, is I recognise success. So, um, last night I, I held a dinner at, at the house for somebody who had been elected as a fellow of one of our national academies, um, you know, just to say, well done. Um, I do a whole series of events, you know, with our leading researchers who, you know, won the um, 
the largest research grants and so forth. So you do have to you do have to celebrate success. You do have to reward, and we have systems of reward uh, in universities. Some of them are promotion, some of them relate to salary, and you've got to get those kinds of things right. So it's no good just saying well done, but there's nothing tangible that sits sits behind that. Um, uh, and, the, the, and, you know, and there are times to you know with some. Uh, you know, very talented but sometimes difficult uh, academics where you've got to have a tough conversation and say, this won't do. Um, and, you know, you just got to get used to doing that. Yeah, I think we, we still have to be careful about this. Um, uh, the, there are rankings that are very lagged, and that's true particularly of the international league. Significant movement in the international league tables is probably lagged by three or four years. So um, one of the things which had held us back in international league tables uh, were, were citations. Um, that we had insufficient highly cited researchers um, and uh, we had insufficient highly cited publications. That's shifting, but it will take three or four years for that to be reflected in, in the QS table and so forth. So um, you don't do things for the league tables, you do the right things, but you hope that they're reflected in the league tables. Um, but then I said to, when we look at the domestic league tables, um, we thought, one, that they were unkind. They're unkind to universities like this. They, they like sort of niche universities. You know, they don't like big, comprehensive universities. The, the, you know, the methodologies they use, the algorithms they use are not very kind to us. I mean, look at where the University of Manchester sits in any national league table. I mean, the University of Manchester is a great uh, university, um, and it's often in the 30s and 40s in national league tables. So, I mean, it just tells you that you know, the methodology is, 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 is pretty poor social science. Um, but take the Guardian League table. Um, when we were looking at league tables, I said to everybody, ignore the Guardian League table. Um, it's, it, it doesn't take any account of research. It's unsympathetic to, to, to the large um, comprehensive universities. Um, and um, the, the algorithmic base of it is pretty questionable. Um, but 10 days ago, we went from 30th to 15th in the Guardian League table. And what I'd now like you to think is that um, but actually, we are now the leading Russell Group Civic in the Guardian League table. Um, but that's happened because our um, staff-student ratios have improved. Uh, our NSS, our National Student Survey uh, performance, has improved. And... Uh, our employability statistics for particularly undergraduates um, have gone through the roof. Um, all of those things were worth doing. Insofar as they're reflected in the league tables, that's great. Um, so, um, when, and there, was a, there was a league table in the New York, Ta in New, yeah, in the New York Times of, you know, remember there are 10,500 universities in the world. Uh, and this was the universities that produced the most employable graduates. And we were 49th in the world. New League Table, I thought that was a really good one, actually. Um, uh, and we were fifth in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but hey, you know, it's a League Table. It's, it's done to sell uh, newspapers. Um, and you, you, you have to understand also the politics of League Tables. So if you take, take the Times higher League Table, um, apart from the fact fact is deeply questionable. Um, so the first time they produce it, there's nobody here from Hong Kong Baptist University, is there? Good. Um, Hong Kong Baptist University was 78th in the first time's higher league table. If anybody's been to Hong Kong Baptist University, um, uh, it shouldn't be in the global top 500. And they finally realised this and it's not. It shows how crummy the league tables are. And also the Times higher league table is designed to enable it to sell copies in other parts of the world. So it's, it's, so it's deliberately deflating the position of UK universities uh, because it wants to increase its global sales. So you, you've got to be careful with league tables. We're moving in, in, in the right direction. Um, uh, but 
but take it from me um, that anybody who knows anything about higher education thinks that this is an outstanding university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.